That's such a gentle um, invitation into worship. Thank you to the, to the bells. And welcome to, to this time of worship. Welcome to those who are coming in online. And let us... I'm going to um, have a couple of announcements. I'm going to invite Mel to come forward to tell us something about the pasta dinner results. Uh, while she's coming forward, just a reminder about the, the survey that we're conducting. Um, I don't know what the number is now, but I think we're aiming for about 150 responses. That's my goal. Um, if we have usually about 70 people at worship and about 80 people who come in online, that makes 150. So I'm, I'm counting on 100% participation in the survey, okay? All right. Um, Mel, but tell us something about the results of our, our more than dinner last night. We'll call it our wonderful evening of fellowship and delicious pasta dinner and amazing silent auction. Thank you to everyone who helped. It really takes a village to put something like this together. The Mission and Outreach Committee could not have done it without each and every one of you. Thank you for your donations of baked goods, of auction items, of reaching out to people in the community to ask for auction items, for people who helped with setup throughout the week and preparing of items, to Deb in the office for all of her hard work getting the transfers and accounting end of things, to all of you who were able to attend last night. We hope that you had a wonderful time. It certainly sounded like everyone was enjoying themselves from the feedback we've received. Thank you to everyone who has offered a kind word or prayerful support of the event this week. It, it really went a long way and we appreciate it. Um, I, we are very pleased to announce the final numbers are still being tabulated and will be throughout this week for sure, but we are very proud to announce that the Pasta Supper and Silent Auction has raised more than $5,000. 100% of those proceeds will go to support those three Ukrainian families, and we can imagine the difference that is that going to make for it months, quite frankly. Uh, one little other story this morning that happened behind the scenes that even those of you that were attending, except for those of you that were in the kitchen, might not be aware of. We did have leftover pasta last night. So Tony Fishback and Chris, who is Kyla's brother-in-law, took the tray of pasta and some disposable bowls and cutlery down to the people that were outside of Royal City and offered them hot pasta last night. And uh, they very gratefully received it and were appreciative so if you left at the right time, you might have seen some of those people enjoying pasta from our leftovers last night. So that's also very kind of Tony and Chris to have taken that down. And just part of our continued outreach here, we wanted to share that with you as well. Again, thank you, everyone. And I'll turn it back over to Kathy. So at the end of this, at the close of the service, um, Shirley, Reverend Shirley and I will be offering again what we offered um, a few months ago, the anointing with oil and prayers for those who would, who would appreciate that. We'll just step over there to that corner and um, I offer the oil and a prayer, a blessing, and anyone who would like to have a prayer with Shirley, she'll sit on that, on that front bench. Let us now receive the Bible. as our guide and foundation for our worship.
Let us call one another into worship using these words in our order of service that are from Psalm 104, mostly. All living things look to you, O God, to give them life and breath. When you give to us, we live. When you breathe, we are filled. When you send forth your spirit, we are created, and the face of the ground is revealed. All who have life and breath. Come, let us worship God together. Let us pray. Let us pray. (laughs) We'll get there. Um, Holy God, you who delight in creating life, and you by whose breath we live and move and have our being, We pray that each breath we receive today will be a chance to live and move in your love and by your grace and in gratitude and joy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now let us sing 259. Maybe you can tell that 
a little later in the service, you're going to hear the story of um, Jesus coming to the disciples and, and Thomas who doubts. So this is our prayer of confession is anticipating that story. Let us join our voices and hearts together in prayer. You know us, O oh God. Much of the time, we are like those early disciples, afraid. We lock ourselves into places where we feel safe and we do not venture out. Even when our friends tell us of something new and wonderful, we can resist, like Thomas. We do not readily move into joy and freedom and peace. Forgive us our resistance. Forgive us our fears. Keep breathing into us, we pray, that we might know life. Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear these words of assurance. There is a, a person, a spirit, who not only lifts up those who have fallen down so they can walk again, but also dwells in them so that they can live by the Spirit. The name of that one is Christ, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A, a wee correction to the bulletin. It's, it's Wendy Derrock, not Nancy Dickinson. Nancy Dickinson will be reading next week. Let us pray. Open our hearts and minds, we pray, O God, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. In Christ's name we pray. Our first scripture reading is from Acts 4, verses 32 to 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. 
There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Our second scripture reading is from John 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house were where the apostles, where the disciples had met, were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hand and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father had sent me, uh, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Let us sing together um, this hymn, 452, which sort of seems to relate to the story we just heard about Jesus standing among us. Come, come, whoever wants to come. It's hard to, I think this is the best spot right here. A small crowd today. Maybe people are recovering. Um, so, 
I'm guessing that you don't remember the first time you took a breath. Has anyone told you about the first time you took a breath? What it was like? Sometimes it's a little bit of an adventure, the first breath, when you're, when you're first born. Yeah. Um, did anyone, has anyone ever taught you how to breathe? No? Just knew how to do it? Okay. Um, do you have any idea how many breaths you've taken in your life? Too many. Too many? <laughs> Too many. What does she mean by that? A lot. It would be a lot to calculate. You need a calculator, and how would you figure that out? I don't know. Like you have to put a tick every time you take a breath. That would drive you crazy. Um, have you ever tried stopping breathing? Underwater. Underwater. Yeah. Have you ever tried like, like, like this, like just stopping? See what happens? Well, during movies, sometimes when characters go underwater. We like to try to hold our breath for the same amount of time. <laughs> and what happens? Sometimes we can do it. <laughs> sometimes you can do it, sometimes not. Okay. Um, so there's this really cool story at the beginning of, right at the beginning of the Bible, of the first breath. And, and God, take, God is described as taking um, some mud, and shaping into human being, into a human being, and then <sighs> breathing into it, and that's when this mud becomes a living human being. And some people would uh, say, uh, like an earthling, because it's mud, mud and mud and breath makes a human being. Mud and breath. Um, so let's just. 10 for a second. Let's just uh, take one long breath in and a long breath out. Maybe just imagining we're that very first human being receiving that first breath. And then there's another story, um, which, well, we just heard actually, but it might have gone by really fast, but it's because it's just it's just so short, little, one little sentence. Um, when the disciples, after, after Jesus' death, and they haven't really yet experienced the resurrected Christ, so they're very afraid, and they're locked in a room. They're really afraid. They've locked themselves in, and um, the resurrected presence of Christ comes to them, and it says, and says, peace be with you, and then breathes on them. Now, I wonder why the resurrected Christ would breathe on them. To show that he was there? Yeah, yeah, to show he was there. Yeah. I wonder what it would have felt like to have... Well, uh, this new, be you know what, it, it's different. Like Jesus, the resurrected Jesus was sort of different from the Jesus they had known. To feel the breath on them. And I wonder what it did for them, what, it, what happened to them. These are just wondering, these are wondering questions. Like, we don't know exactly what it was like. But we do know a little bit of what, what happened after that. Um, they just weren't quite as afraid. Yeah. Um, so how about we pray and um, when I take, I'm going to take a, I, I'm going to have a few breaths in my prayer and when I take a big long breath, you can imitate you can do it along with me, okay? So let's start with let's start our prayer with a big breath. You, O oh God, are our breath.
You, O God, are our breath. Help us, we pray, pray. to receive each breath as a gift from you. you. Now we'll take another breath. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Those bells are so joyful. Thank you. And thank you, choir. Let us pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the ponderings of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable to you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So last week I mentioned that one reason to worship in Metcalf Hall, which thank you all for being willing to try that, um, was to strengthen our change muscles. We all know something about change because it's in our very bodies, right? We age and that we know those changes. And Knox has undergone a number of changes in the last few years. And we're also very aware of how our culture, our larger culture, is changing, especially for congregations. We've talked a little bit about how immigration patterns have changed. And then there's the changes in technology, which has a huge impact on all of us. 
If we thought that the 20th century was uh, full of change, which many of us can, you know, are aware and we're living through those, electricity, indoor plumbing, cars, TV, computers, um, the 21st century, only a quarter of the way in, is, our, is going even faster, I would say. That's what they say, that the, the, the pace of technological change that we are going through right now is unprecedented. Um, as an example, um, you know, Facebook began in 2004, that launched social media. And then the first smartphone was introduced in 2007. So in 20 years, there's been a complete uh, revolution in how we communicate and what we know about the rest of the world. And it has had an impact on how we, how we relate to one another, our relationships, and more so the younger generation than the older, but nevertheless, it impacts us as well. And also how our brains work. This is what they're concerned about. How are our brains working because of the smartphone? And, and then there's a huge cultural change as well, which they call postmodernism, which means a questioning of all kinds of authority and the idea that we create our own truth. That's, what, that's one thing that postmodernism is about. So a change of ideas. And that's, that really affects the church, really um, it makes it hard for the church to talk about uh, authority and truth. So in my previous work, with, um, which was with different congregations in different denominations, we regularly introduced them to this graphic, which you have in your bulletin and in your insert, and I invite you to pull that out at this point, called the change curve. I'm just going gonna, gonna to talk about that a little bit and then I'll sh and about how it relates to uh, our gospel passage. So I should just say, okay, I don't want to totally credit Credence with this because it's my artwork, and they'd probably be a little bit um, humbled to think that, uh, you know, to, <laughs> this, is, this is my artwork, um, not theirs. But the ideas come from Credence. So, um, so people who re do research into human psychology say that we, as human beings, we really don't like change. It's, in fact, part of our DNA. Um, even changes that we look forward to uh, require energy and bring some stress. So change is often accompanied, and this is on the left-hand side of the curve, it's often accompanied with grief because change involves giving up something. It's often accompanied with anxiety um, because we don't know what to expect. We're going into something new. And so change feels like a bit of a downer. Uh, it's, oh, and I was, did this get onto online? It did, okay, so the online people can see it too. Way to go, Brian. Um, um, so these things on the left-hand side, loss, disorientation, anxiety, confusion, detaching, letting go. Um, this, is, this feels like it's hard. It's hard for us. Um, and note the, uh, note the broken zip line. <laughs> we would probably prefer to just zip across to the other side, to whatever we have to move to, and not experience that stress, some of those hard things. But apparently, it really does not work. It doesn't work. You can't do it. And this is sort of interesting. Um, so there's something about the stress of, of change that's maybe... This, Part, something that we need, actually, to shake us loose and open us, open us up and to help us to grow into something new. It's a process. We can't just zip across. So um, for people of faith, what if that down curve is actually necessary for us to open up to trusting and to experiencing God's Presence. What if we need that down? We don't really like it, but what if we need that in order to be able to, to open our eyes in a new way and to trust God and to, and to learn to trust ourselves and each other? So indeed, the Bible recounts, this is where, oh, that, well, okay, that Bible, it always, you know, challenges us. It has all these stories about God initiating change, change after change after change, that God sort of seems to initiate. That's how the people of faith understood it. And, and we are invited to keep up with what God is doing. So God initiated. 
Abraham and Sarah, leave your land and go to a completely new place. I wonder if that felt like a down to them. Who knows? Uh, the slaves in Egypt. Okay, now you're going to follow Moses into the desert. It's going to be a new experience. Go. Uh, Jesus to the disciples. Okay, drop your fishing, that what you are familiar with and have done all your life, and follow me. That's a change curve. Um, Jesus to the early disciples. You thought that the temple was really important? Now you are the temple. Change curve. What's that mean? And then Peter. Peter, you thought that eating with Gentiles was wrong? Think again. Meet Cornelius, the Roman soldier, and have supper with him. Change curve. And as we know, people resisted over and over again, and then they grew, and the life of faith, uh, the life of faith grew, and the church grew. So we have on the right-hand side of this change curve, um, we also have, we see those stories in the Bible about people exploring and adjusting and getting new information and talking and experimenting and regaining hope and commitment and excitement. So, okay, so there it is. You could, you could probably stick this on your fridge. Like, I, I think I need to stick this on my fridge. Every time I'm going through a change, I go, okay, take a deep breath because this is part of God's story to go through these change curves. Okay. So as the, now let's turn to our gospel. So as the story opens, the disciples have locked themselves into a room in Jerusalem. You might say locking themselves into what was familiar, like holding on to what was familiar. They're afraid. Okay, the, okay I'm really tempted to say this. I have to say this. This is a little joke for Her Howard. You can ask him later if you want. Ho Howard, they weren't just apprehensive. They were afraid. <laughs> uh, you can ask Howard, but that's about um, their world has been turned upside down. And as John tells it, only Mary Magdalene has experienced the risen Christ at this point. Only one of them, and she's a woman, so they don't really believe her. So really, none of them are expecting this. And they are disoriented. So that's, that's part of that, that's the part of that left-hand side of the change curve. Um, they're experiencing loss. They're unsettled. They're anxious. They're confused. They're starting to detach and this is the beautiful part of this story. Right into that bottom of that change curve, into this chaotic state, the risen Christ appears to them and breathes on them. This is sometimes called, this story is sometimes called John's Pentecost. John's version of Pentecost. Pentecost, we know as the story when the Spirit came, the Holy Spirit came and breathed on the disciples. It's described in a different way in Acts. But it's recalling that story in Genesis 1, creation. So Jesus breathing on the disciples here in that locked room is like, uh, it's like a recreation. It's like creation part two, creation anew. Jesus breathing onto them that they're experiencing new life. And, and, so, and says, the same spirit that was in me is now in you, and I send you as the Father sent me. So we, if I was them, they, how, can, how can we as disciples be sent as Jesus was sent? But what we see in the, in the stories that follow, they they did venture out in many new ways after, this, after these experiences. They, um, they, they preached to crowds from all over the Mediterranean. They stood before governors. They sat at table with Roman soldiers. They baptized Ethiopian eunuchs. They met all kinds of people that, like, they were just, they were just humble guys from Galilee, and they just, their world just opened up. And notice that Referring back to this again. The resurrected Christ did not take them back to what they knew. It wasn't going back up the, you know, back to this, you're familiar. It was taking them forward into something, into something new. Reori reorientation, a new way. And one of the, there's lots of ways in which they were reoriented, but one of them was the spirit 
Jesus said, the Spirit is now in you. You are now the one who carries the Spirit of God out into the world. So I think the question for us now is, is the resurrected Christ still breathing? Still breathing into us as disciples and giving us renewed orientation, leading us from disorientation to reorientation. And if the risen Christ is, what, what would it be like and what would we look for? As a church, someone would, some would say that there is no precedent to the amount of disorientation that we as the church are experiencing right now, the church in the 21st century, that there's hardly any precedent. Some would point to the time of the Reformation and say that was a pretty big time of disorientation. Um, but it was, and it was, but it wasn't, I think ours is even more because that was sort of within the church and our disorientation is even, you know, the whole world is like, it's, it's a different situation. But, what, but it is helpful to look back into history and what the people at that time discovered was they needed to learn how to uh, pray in a different way. That's what they discovered. They, they were, they realized that what they needed was encounter with the life-giving presence that is described in that, in that story. We need, we need an encounter with the life-giving presence of the resurrected Christ. And what they discovered was those promises in, that are in, in John 14, when, when Jesus says, we have come to make our home in you. That's what they discovered. So we, us, we, Knox, and other churches, we are in a time, we are, at, basically, we are at, in a lot of ways, maybe not totally, but we are at the bottom of that curve. We are disoriented. And we are longing for life-giving presence. And the wisdom of our ancestors is, we need, well, there's another way to describe it. I mean, they learned how to pray in a different way. You might say, we need some right brain experience of Christ. Not just our logical voice, but our imaginative voice needs to speak. And we need silence. That's when often we need, that's something we can hear. So I'm going to invite you into a short right brain experience of receiving called a guided meditation. And you may have never done this before, and you've probably never done it in sermon time, but that's okay. And I'll also tell you, I'm not going to ask you to talk to anybody, okay? Because <laughs> I know that creates. I'll just invite you to just receive uh, what I'm going to offer. It's a different, different way of knowing. I invite you to, um, it's helpful if you're sort of relaxed. And... I invite you, if you'd like, you can close your eyes. That's probably easier if you close your eyes for you. And I also invite you to... Um, so we're going to slow down a little bit here. We're all going to slow down a bit. I'm going to slow down, invite you to slow down a little bit. And uh, take a slow breath in. And release it slowly. And another one. And remember that this is the breath that makes us live. And in another breath, I invite you to release the tension in the muscles in your face and in your shoulders and in your arms and your hands. And I invite you to imagine that you are in a room with some of your friends 
and you're there because you're all afraid. And the doors are locked and the curtains drawn and the air is thick. All ears are on hyper alert. Every noise in the street is analyzed and deciphered. Every footstep followed until it fades away. It's exhausting. Maybe because of this hypervigilance, you become aware of a presence in the room. That's the only way to describe it, a presence. And then a voice, peace be with you. It's a familiar voice that immediately makes your heart both leap and relax. Leap with joy, relax with relief. Again, the voice says, peace be with you. And the voice says, I send you as I was in the world, forgiving, loving, speaking the truth. And through you, through you, the world will know me. And before your mind has a time to object or resist, you hear a sound. Sound of breath. A long, slow, steady breath, and you feel it on your face, and you suck it in, and the breath makes you relax, and you take it in as you would take in the sun coming out after days of rain. You take in the breath as you would take in a stream of water in the middle of a desert. As you would take in the warm embrace of a loved one come home. And you receive this as the gift of life and you give thanks. And you become aware you're in the presence of the one who makes the universe and breathes into all of creation. And you receive this breath. And the room gradually seems too small. And you wonder what would happen if you threw open the windows and went out into the street. And when we are ready, Let's move back into this room. 
this room here in Guelph and open our eyes. Let us join our, our voices and our breath in singing together. O oh, breath of life, come sweeping through us. We didn't really focus on the, the scent part of the story, but the breath that Jesus breathes into the disciples is to send them, send them out, send them forth. As I was sent, so I send you. And we hear those stories of what scent looks like in the stories that follow, of how the, the Spirit pushes those disciples out into mission and into outreach. So mission and outreach is not just one of our committees at a church, but it, it's really central to who we are as a church. We are sent. So today we are celebrating, as, as we think about our offering, we are thinking and celebrating about the offerings that have been made in the last week or so and, and last night a powerful offering of ourselves in response to the need of the world around us, specifically refugees from Ukraine. People offered in many ways, as Mel listed all the ways in which people offered of themselves, donating an item, buying an item, coming and being in a meal together, setting up and taking down, 
So the event last night and the work of the Refugee Committee over years is one of the ways in which we respond to this, I send you, I send you out. And our response is our offering of ourselves. So we pray that we will continue to have eyes and hearts open for opportunities to live into this calling of being sent that we can offer of ourselves. So let us sing our offering prayer. join our hearts together in prayer. We come, O oh God, as those who have life and breath because of your gifts. And we turn our hearts to you, you who surround us with love like the very air itself. And we come hoping to remember your first breath and our every breath. Thank you for the most intricate way the life of this planet is held together by breath. Trees and plants sucking in CO2 and offering us oxygen. This web of life of giving and receiving. We thank you for every tree that we have passed by to come here today and every shrub that we see out our window in the morning. We thank you for forsythias that have started to bloom and daffodils that are out now. We also give you thanks for the way you seem to always come saying, peace be with you, and saying, I forgive you. So we pray as remembering the fear of those disciples back then and how you ministered to them we pray for those who, like them, are afraid. Afraid of the unknown of the future. Afraid of being alone. Afraid of failing. Afraid of test results. Afraid of loss. We know there are people in the world who are afraid that there is no food and afraid of what might fall from the sky and are afraid of dying. We pray that your breath would sustain all who are afraid. We remember, particularly at this point, those who are struggling and experiencing loss and reaching for hope and new life. And we think of um, Bob Renton in rehab. We think of the Cleary family and others who are suffering in loss. We think of the friends of a, a young man who committed suicide yesterday. We pray for peace for peace between neighbors, peace in families, peace in the church, peace between nations. We'll have a sense of the shared gift that we have in breath. And we pray that we, in some small way, we become the gifts that are sent into the world, that give life. In Christ's name we pray. We pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come down, O love divine. Go now in peace to breathe and to live into our sentness, sent by Christ. And let us, as we go forth, let us remember that God, our creator, is ever creating us anew. And Jesus, our brother, he's walking the road before us. And the Holy Spirit Comforter is brooding over us as a mother over her children, helping us in our weakness, interceding for us with sighs too deep for words, and working and longing to bring us into new life. Praise be to God.
So Reverend Shirley and I, those who like the gift of anointing. Thank <laughs> you. 